here. Criminal defense attorney Dwayne Cates joining us here on live now from Fox. Dwayne, thanks so much for being here. A lot to break down with everything that has gotten up to this point. Let's first begin with closing statements as a whole. What are your thoughts on, on everything that has happened through today? Well, the closing arguments, I, you know, I think both sides did, did a pretty good job. There were some things that they did that, that, that I really didn't kind of like both of them. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's their jurisdiction. They allow, allow them to do that, but they were vouching. They were saying things like, you know, I believe, you know, I believe this is the way things are. And, and you're just kind of not supposed to do that. I think the defense had a really strong closing argument. I really do. And, you know, it could have been stronger had he had he been a better uh, orator rather than a reader of his statement. But the last three or four or five minutes of the defense's uh, 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 closing argument really got me. And also, uh, speaking of their closing arguments, yesterday the jurors paid a visit to the Moselle property where Maggie and Paul were both killed. How critical was that to their closing statements? Well, I think it's really important because you can look at all the maps and the Google Maps and the, and the diagrams that you want to, but until you're actually there and you put things in perspective and you see how far things are apart and you see what things look like and you see what things sound like, you know, it makes a big difference for jurors to see that. It really does. Now, what are your thoughts on the defense bringing up this argument that potentially Paul his actions could have led to his own demise, referring to uh, the incident with the drugs, potentially that this could have involved uh, uh, Paul's dad's drug dealer in this situation. What were your thoughts on that theory that they presented? Well, you know, the defense, you know, gets to have all the theories they want. They don't have to prove anything. And it's always helpful to have different theories that you can point to other than what the prosecutor's saying. You know, I, it probably fell a little weak, but you know what? All it takes is one jury to believe that testimony, and it's a hung jury. There's also the theory that there were potentially two shooters, that Alec couldn't have done that for that for that very reason. Uh, what are your thoughts on that argument in the evidence pre presented behind that? I think that's a really good argument. It just really, I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of homicide trials, and I've never had somebody use two different guns to kill somebody. I've had two different guns, you know, at a homicide scene, but they're usually being used by two different people. And I think that that theory makes the most sense. And their crime scene investigator, you know, articulated that pretty well. And then, of course, uh, something that we talked about right before bringing you on the show here, Dwayne, was that a female juror was kicked out of court today. This is now uh, not the first time that this has happened. A few other jurors had COVID earlier on. So uh, what does that mean for the case now? Well, it means they only got one more left. And so they better get through deliberations before they lose another one, you know, or two, or we could end up with uh, having to uh, do this whole thing over. Losing a jury, a juror is not uncommon. That's why they have alternate jurors so that they can get through the deal. Only the participants, only the people in the courtroom that have been watching this every day will be able to tell you whether that was good or bad for either side. And I know it's uh, hard to put a number on the timeline of, of how long this could take for jurors to reach a verdict, but do you have any thoughts on how long or how short this may take for them to reach a decision? Well, I tell you what, I could tell you how long I think it's going to be, but I would be wrong because I'm almost always wrong, even in my own case. I can tell you that, that jury watch is the worst part of a trial, is waiting for a jury to come back. I've had juries take six days. I've had juries come back before I got to the cafeteria. So you just never know how it's going to work. Now, with this much evidence, you think that they would spend some time in going through it. A lot of times jurors at, at night will come to a decision that night and say, let's sleep on it, come back the next day. So, But usually jurors, they either come back first thing in the morning or they come back at the end of the day. And uh, just thinking back to before this trial even began, everybody knew it was going to be a big deal. So many eyes on it, but the, it's been very complex. There's been so many uh, details that have been presented throughout the trial. Has this gone the way that you maybe initially had envisioned, knowing the background behind it, the amount of publicity behind it? 
Well, you know what? There's always three trials. There's the one you plan, the one you do, and the one you wish you would have done when it's over. Because th trials, t trials have a life of their own. They take on a life of their own. And as a trial goes, you know, you never know wh what twists and turns are going to come down the road. And so they never turn out how you think they're going to ever. All right. Thanks so much, criminal defense attorney Dwayne Cates, joining us here on Live Now from Fox. A lot of great perspective here, Dwayne. We appreciate you joining us here this afternoon. No problem. Thank you for having me on.